Start the recording. Well, welcome. So, uh, welcome. This is Monday, November 6, 2024. Uh, we are now starting our Astro Cafe at three o'clock universal time instead of four o'clock because some silly people have decided to change our local time, but um, we do go by local time and it's seven o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time. Tonight, let's see, I have a list of the various things that are happening tonight, but of course I didn't get it out in time. So, uh, uh, Randy, just to say too, um, it's we've lost this microphone again, so we're using the one that's on the camera. So oh, have to project at the screen. Okay, okay. good to know. <laughs> am I am I clear? Am I clear? Good. Okay. So the feature uh, this evening will be Michaela and you and Sedman, but I also, um, Joe, will you talk about the calendar? I don't know, Will Joe. He's not nodding his head. Photo <laughs> 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 hasn't moved. Was there an And uh, there is a request that we see whether we would like to do an equipment swap sometime before Christmas. So just we'll cue that up. Uh, and then there is the uh, council meeting next week. Uh, there is the November 8th meeting at the University. Reg, where are you, Reg? I'd be right behind you. Okay. And you'll talk about that? All the way. Briefly. Okay. And then, if people are interested, I have a talk about ghost craters on the moon. Okay. Is there anything else? Does anybody have some pictures? David Lee. I have two things. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about two of the SIGs that are happening this week. And uh, along with Reg, uh, I hopefully will reveal a narrowband image that we took from the VCO recently. Great. Okay. Anybody else have pictures or anything? Come on. It was lovely skies this week. <laughs> okay. So, um, since they're all queued up, uh, it would be lovely to invite uh, you and Michaela to, to speak. They wrote this summer saying they're coming by and uh, and they actually joined us last week, but uh, today they have the floor. And I'm really curious to uh, hear about amateur astronomy in Switzerland. Well, thank you. I mean, and first of all, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, we're going to uh, spend however long it takes. Uh, it can be as short or as long as you need it to be. But uh, go for it. Go we're for going it. to uh, give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of a background on what's happening astronomy-wise uh, in Switzerland. Um, the society that we are working with, which is the Société Astronomy de Haut-Lemont, which is uh, in Vevey in Switzerland. So Vevey is just kind of between. Montreux and uh, Lausanne. Okay, so it's the Montreux. top end of the lake, what you would call Lake Geneva, that we call Lac Léman. Okay, and there's a picture of it there taken by uh, our colleague and uh, capturing a bit of the Milky Way from. So the light pollution that you see below, that's the city of Vevey actually, and the our observatory uh, is a bit at the upper end of the of the town, at the foothills of the mountains. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, you know what we do there, what we have, the equipment, etc. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the that the, we, Michaela and I in particular, have been doing to, together with David uh, in terms of sensitizing and educating people in the uh, the subject of light pollution. And uh, you'll see quite a few slides on that because we today we're not just representing Sal. The uh, Le Mans 
society, we're representing Dark Sky Switzerland, as we're active members of Dark Sky Switzerland, which is part of the Dark Sky International Association, uh, as well as our own, it's not a company because we're individuals, our own uh, educational material that we uh, produce, the books that we've written uh, on various ecological subjects, including uh, light pollution. So we'll take you through a little journey along that, and uh, we'll also leave you at the end with a copy of the presentation, which also includes educational materials for light pollution for children, uh, which you're perfectly free to use uh, according to you know how it, how it see fit. Wonderful. Okay, so that's that's the kind of the framework, and if it wakes up, which it doesn't, yeah, okay. So a little bit, uh, I mean, first of all, I'm pretty sure everybody knows where Switzerland is. Um, it's, uh, but it's a, it's a country which uh, you know, is, is landlocked and uh, is actually comprised, the system of Switzerland is, uh, it, we have federal and what we call cantonal um, regions. So we live in the area just in fact we live about here where my pointer is on the screen that people can see it uh up in the mountains and this is lausanne here and uh, this area is the french speaking part of, of switzerland and the further east that you go it rapidly becomes the the german speaking part and to the south you have italian speaking uh, areas down down here so the, the pictures that you can see there are actually from one of the observatories in the in the valley, um, which is this area that, that goes beyond the end of the, the lake of Lake Geneva up into the mountains. And this is the observatory of Saint Luc. And uh, the, there's Michaela, myself, and uh, our colleague David and the guy who runs the the uh, observatory of San Luke, which is around about two thousand three hundred meters high, something like that. Yeah, and you can see you can see it's a nice place to do astronomy. Um, it's nice in the summer and it's super nice in the winter. Um, okay, let me advance. So, in terms of the overall architecture of astronomy in Switzerland. We have uh, more than 50 different observatories in Switzerland, um, seven of which you can't see them on this slide because they're kind of buried underneath the, the actual observatories, but seven of them have their own planetariums, um, in, as you'll see, including, including ours. Uh, so we use those also for running the educational sessions for the public. Um, and there's more than 51 astronomy, ast astronomical societies uh, in Switzerland, including which is 10, 10 of which are official research institutes uh, from, the, from the government. And I just included the link there in case you're curious. Unfortunately, of course, in Switzerland, English is not one of the recognized languages. So official languages. There's lots of Brits in England, uh, in Switzerland for sure, um, but it's not one of the official languages, so most of the uh, things are either in French, German, Italian, or Romance. The, uh, the, the smallest language in Switzerland, we have four, four official languages. So the uh, society that we belong to, SAL, Society Astronomie de Reglement, um, it's actually created back in 1970 by four uh, enthusiastic amateurs. Um, and they, they established with the, the aid of a donation from a benefactor in 1970 called the first uh, observatory that we have. We currently have, we're a bit smaller than you, which is why I was asking earlier, we have around about 160 wow. members. Um, How many are active? Um, a lot less than 160, I yeah, would say. 50. Uh, 50. 50. <laughs> are really, uh, 50 are really active. Yeah. Um, and what you what we what we do have, and you and I've included the link for the website at the bottom. Again, it is in French, but you you can see that there's a lot of things that we do, particularly for the public. So you know, our aims are really to enable our members to to profit from the equipment, obviously, that we have. Um, 
but also to popularize and promote astronomy to the public. So uh, we run bi-weekly uh, obs obs observation sessions for the general public, um, and that's free of charge. So people just can sign up and come along, and our experts or animators will uh, help people get set up, use the telescopes, you know, be able to see things, um, and uh, give them some you know, some educational activities. Uh, we also do the same thing if we're not able to use the uh, the scopes because of uh, clouds or whatever. Uh, we also have the built-in planetarium, which we use, and those sessions are also free of charge, so people can sign up for them. Um, and the other thing that we do, of course, is uh, to help people like myself who are really at the amateur end of the, the amateur astronomy uh, brackets is to how to um, improve their experience with their own equipment as well. So, you know, like all clubs, uh, we we try to help each other. So those are those are the principal aims, and feel free to to have a look on the on the website. Uh, we have a new chairman who's really, I think, in the last uh, six months or so, really injected a lot of energy and vigor into the club. Um, and uh, you know, it's really a positive development that uh, we see uh, lots of activity and we have a lot of really nice public events in the evenings and things nowadays. And he is also um, a very happy, if anybody wants to reach out, yeah. he speaks perfect English. Yeah. Um, uh, he's a, a businessman and, um, so, and he is very keen on extending knowledge and, and connections. So if you if you feel um, you would like to engage in conversations, you would be absolutely thrilled. Yeah. So in terms of the observatory itself, and at the present time, the main scope is a, is a 14 inch edge that, that we're using, but we're just in the process of upgrading that to a 16 inch scope, um, which should be hopefully arriving fairly soon. Um, and we also have, I mean, we have a number of other smaller smaller scopes that we use for uh, different things, uh, the Newtons and the Celestron A, for example, and uh, specific scopes for, for astro work, astrophotography. And this one is just to give you some, uh, the, the picture on the left, that's real astrophotography. David, our colleague, he, he, he built his first telescope when he was nine years old, I think, and has been doing astrophotography most of his life. And the rest of my rather pathetic attempts at uh, doing astrophotography with my new baby telescope that I have, and uh, it's still going to look bad. It's they do better when the images are smaller. They don't know what <laughs> <them out>. so, <laughs> it's, uh, but it's fair to say that yeah, you know, I only really started getting into astrophotography after I stopped formally working at the retirement in inverted commas, whatever that means. And um, I worked all of my life in medical sciences. Um, and I felt when I stopped working, I thought it would be a good idea to do something more in the physical science world to continue my, my learning. So I bought myself a, a telescope. And, and actually, the, these pictures are taken with a really small portable telescope. I don't know if you, do you know the Vespera? Come across the Vespera? Vespera is a French um, technology. Yeah. Can somebody uh, so someone put their hand up, have they? Yes, sorry. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. That's me. Um uh, we're losing your we're losing your um your audio a little bit. Uh, because I'm um, turning to the audience here, sorry, my apologies. Well, it was almost more when you, sorry, when you put your hand in front of your face, uh, oh, okay. we, uh, yeah. uh, we just lost it for a little bit. So if you wouldn't mind, um, yeah. I just, no, no, yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for letting me know. The, um, we, lost the, we lost one of the microphones, but. Uh, oh, okay. This okay. is um is actually, it's made by Veonis. It's a, it's a French company. It's a very really small scope, 50 millimeter scope. It's only really for deep sky, but it actually has all of the algorithms for stacking uh, photographs yeah. in, built in, and it fits in my backpack. Wow. So I take it where it weighs less than five kilos. I take it wherever I want to go. I set it up. It takes me three minutes to set it up, and 
most of these uh, images were taken off our terrace in Spain, actually, in our house in Spain. So uh, I also have a, a, a Celestron 8 inch, which I'm uh, currently gathering data and learning better processing skills because uh, that's, that's my big problem is the, you know, my ability to process data. Okay, let's let's change change tax a little bit and talk a little bit about light pollution uh, in Switzerland, because this is one of the areas that we've been working on particularly. And uh, the the following uh, eight or nine slides are, are courtesy of the president of Dark Sky Switzerland, Elliot Gunnar. Um, and I also owe a big thanks for translating them into English for me and sending them to me to save me from doing the the translation myself. So. Uh, Switzerland, okay. Switzerland, we're quite small compared to you, um, at least compared to the whole of Canada, 0.4% um, of Canada. Um, and uh, we have a population around about 9 million. I think Switzerland and Vancouver Island are about the same. You'll see that, you'll see that in a, little, in a couple of slides time. <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah. And most of the people in Switzerland live along that flat bit in the middle. That, uh, that see the side of the range of mountains. And uh, th that area is much more densely populated, as you'll see in coming coming slides. Mm. Yeah, and you know, it's no surprise that uh, artificial light at night happens where people live. And you see it very clearly uh, there. You see the hotspots of Zurich and uh, Geneva. Uh, for example, even Lausanne, you can see them um, just in between on the bottom of where the lake is there. Um, so that gives you some idea of uh, of you know, where where we have our our light challenges. Um, it's fair to say that in the last five years or so in Switzerland, that there has been a large increase in the number of municipalities, the cantons and the, the communes uh, in Switzerland, which are really actively trying to, to implement night curfews and, and moderating unwanted light for in the public sector. It's become quite trendy. Um, and typically between midnight and 6 a.m. once the buses have stopped, a lot of the street lighting is is turned down, um, and interestingly, it started largely in smaller villages, and uh, you know it's even in the cities nowadays. Um, however, having said that, it's still true that we still have a lot of unwanted, un unwanted we, we lights. Noticed, we noticed that when we were in France uh, mm -hmm. in June, that there are a bunch of villages in the south of France that are going dark at night. Yep. Yeah. 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 So was this a planned strategy to get people to to view it as a trend and, and want to do it? How, how did you achieve such a thing? In France, actually, um, uh, it, it is part, and we, we see it later, it's part of the law since quite um, a while. They have been really avant-garde with that, and it was really voluntarily to for the purpose of light pollution. Um, how you do it, it's, and we, we talk about it a little bit later as well, it's mainly um, initiatives starting in villages, and then it grows. And then there are a few events um, that have started to grow, um, specifically aimed of decreasing the, the light in, in the night, and um, we talk it, uh, yeah. about it a little bit later. So yeah, I mean, what you what you see is that uh, you know for sure in the Swiss plateau we're seeing a lot more new curfews at night. Um, the lighting itself is still a challenge in terms of the type of lighting. So uh, we are still trans you know transitioning to lower. Kelvin LED technologies. There's still a lot of uh, light which is uh, way too harsh, um, but that's also creating uh, more of a halo effect. So it is working, but but interestingly, you know, what we're beginning to see now is that we see less uh, light at night in populated areas, and there and has been a bit of an increase in natural areas, funnily enough. And I'm, I'm not sure that we have a complete understanding as to why that is, but 
Um, that is what we've been seeing just over the last couple of years. And uh, you know, overall, the light is decreasing uh, over a 10 year period. It, certainly it's it's in the right direction and it's nowhere near as, as good as we would like it to be, I think. Well, how was that measured? And I'm also surprised that in 2020 with COVID did have more of a blip one way or the other. Uh, maybe that's the 2021 blip. Yeah, the 2021 blip, it goes up. Yeah. But do you know how that was measured? That's... With the, um, um, uh, oh, uh, the material, yeah. We'll, we'll show in a couple of slides some of the material that we're using. I, I think with Dark Sky, are using the same, I mean, I think it's an active area, they're using the same challenge. We're using light meters. In, in different locales and then collating the data. You'll see some slides that we're, we're using uh, ourselves, uh, the same system. So <laughs> to come to your point, okay, fall 2022, yeah. energy crisis, yes. And there's nothing like a good crisis to ensure that the yeah. government will step up and start reacting. Of course, so uh, the, the invasion of the uh, Ukraine, of course, sadly did create then an energy crisis, and suddenly electricity uh, prices started mounting. And every day, the towns were, were announcing that they needed to make changes in order to manage their budgets. And uh, Actually, you'll see what happened in Switzerland is, is that in, in um, I think it was federally, they had a decree, but cantonally, so in the different Swiss states, they introduced legal frameworks for turning off lights at night, public lighting in particular. And here you it's see, exciting, yeah. you see the difference one, you know, one minute before midnight, midnight and one minute after midnight. So how much of your power generation? Is hydro and how much is by fossil fuel? Hydro is it's about 25, yeah, 30 percent. Yeah, yeah, we're not yeah. completely independent, mm. um, uh, but the um, there is a clear trend uh, nowadays, they are trying very hard to, to be independent and um, really uh, focusing on renewable energies, whatever it's uh, solar energy. Hydro, uh, whatever. Uh, There's actually a new law which is just uh, under consultation at the present time, um, which is really designed to make a big uh, demand on on the country to change its energy sources. Actually, and that that should, in theory, become law in the next year or so. The, the the Swiss legal the Swiss government I could spend an hour talking about the Swiss government center uh, system but uh, <laughs> um, don't get us started <laughs> yeah but we're very democratic in Switzerland you know if you want to change a, if you want to change the law in Switzerland you only need I think it's a hundred thousand signatures and you can have a national referendum so we have national referendums on some of the most bizarre subjects that you could possibly imagine, but usually sense prevails. Uh, so would you recommend that Canada follow in Europe's and Switzerland's footsteps by seeking to have Russia invade the United States? So you can start sky calls. Hopefully you can find other. I think Canada is way ahead of the United States in terms of dark sky policy somehow, but yeah. let's let's see. The, the, actually the really interesting thing is that um you know the, the towns actually are really in good shape. Um generally I and mean, we have a lot of discussions you'll you'll hear a little bit in a, in a minute about that but actually since uh, 2019 there's uh, a once a year event which in geneva which actually was kept taken from events which have been run in france uh, in fact where france are, are actually considerably ahead of switzerland right. in terms of that which is called la nuit est belle the night is beautiful where you turn up all the public lights in geneva for a night yeah? But the really interesting thing is that when you turn all the public lighting, all the street lighting off, 
uh, it reduces it by about 35 percent or mm. something like that, and sixty five percent of it is adverse for McDonald's or uh, companies or whatever. Yeah. And people, um, private, private properties. Yeah. Yeah. Buildings for so, yeah. Yeah. so turning off street lights in in itself, is, of course, is a good thing uh, and helps a lot, but. Actually, the majority is not uh, actually the uh, the city, and neither is that in terms of the consumption of the energy necessarily either. So, um, yeah, and uh, in terms of the private sector, in, in 2021, um, four of the cantons basically required people to, um, in the private sector, required businesses to turn off their lights at night, uh, which is basically... The French speaking part, actually. Um, and typically after midnight, 1 a.m., the businesses had to comply. And uh, there are some political differences that we see more resistance in the uh, more traditional German speaking parts of, of Switzerland around Zurich, uh, as opposed to the Geneva area, for example. So there's still a lot of work to be done to educate people and you know in terms of the you know who, who actually is responsible for doing what i mean in the eu uh, switzerland of course is not in the eu but it is part of the schengen group of countries um but in the eu there's only a couple of countries croatia and france who really have a formal legal frame framework for for controlling light pollution um and in Switzerland, there have been several attempts, and we work closely with one of the uh, members of parliament in, in Switzerland, um, who, who's been trying very hard to introduce legislation at a federal level, but this has not uh, been past the first gate, actually. Um, uh, so actually, in the in particularly in response to the energy crisis, most of the cantons did introduce non-binding guidelines. Um, in Canton Bull, as I mentioned, which is where we live, um, in the uh, Lausanne area, there is a new uh, law which is uh, under consultation at the present time. And uh, you know, the idea being that we will enforce the idea of turning off public lighting at night, except in, in particularly sensitive areas being more intelligent about the types of uh, uh, lighting that we use um, and uh, you know, just simple mechanical adjustments, you know, not pointing the light up but pointing it down is, is already uh, uh, a, good, a good way to, to, do, to do it. So um, there is... So just to, to answer as well part of your question earlier, how it is achieved? So in Canton Vaux for the law that is currently presented and reviewed, we um, have been in contact with the politicians. We had uh, several roundtable discussions, which you will see later. And then we were invited to give our feedback on the, on the text. So next week we have a meeting with our president um, um, to go through the text and to review. Yeah, the president of SAR. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. SAR, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, to, uh, to go through the text and um, give our comments whether we feel that um, the, uh, the recommendations or the guidelines uh, that are transformed are actually enough to, to, to decrease the light pollution. So, these are, this is the last of the, the slides from Elliot. Uh, so, the I think the, the takeaway is that actually we've made a lot of progress in the last seven, eight uh, years. Um, it has largely been a top-down approach, and uh, particularly in the last couple of years, triggered largely by economic concerns, not by altruism for astronomers. Uh, no one's saying we should turn off all the lights so that you guys can take better pictures. So yes, uh, that's clear. And we're also... I think savvy enough to know that you jump on a horse that's uh, traveling in the right direction mm -hmm. and you and you use that to the best effect that you can. Um, but it has raised awareness um, that light pollution is a topic um, and it has created uh, momentum for, for change. And part of that process 
then turning to some of the work that we've been doing in, uh, in our uh, society, uh, we started back in, in 2022, um, you know, really to take a, a look at what we could do locally in the first instance, and, and then broaden it out from there. And I think that you know, the why is very clear, I mean, apart from the fact that um, everybody really has the right to see a beautiful sky, um, the simple fact is, is that flora and fauna are adversely affected by our natural light. And there's uh, multiple instances, examples of that which are in our educational materials. And there's also a lot of increasing evidence that having uh, unnatural light at night is also a, a detriment to human health. A lot of data coming out now, I think, like pancreatic yeah. cancer uh, and other thing, other other diseases where there are the beginnings of you know, evidence statistically that uh, it's not good for your wake sleep cycle. And the human body built on, built on diurnal variation. So, uh, you know, how did we decide to uh, approach this? Because it's a massive topic for a small an astronomy society. Um, so we, we took basically three um, kind of arms to this. And the first is to contribute to the gathering of data through, through citizen science. So uh, by making light pollution measurement data both available locally and also to um, the, the, the wider uh, community um, to educate and raise awareness. Um, and one of the things that Michaela and I you know, thought was really important is, is that the way to affect change is to create awareness in young audiences. Most of us have already formed our values, uh, the way that we behave. Children, the next generations, will decide how people want to live their life in, in the world. So we, we wanted to really bring two young audiences into schools uh, through educational material, simple gestures. So you'll see a little bit about what we created uh, in a few minutes. Um, and ultimately, as I already uh, alluded to, the, um, the economical aspects uh, really provided a and there was this temporary decree in our canton to turn off non-essential lighting and that was up for review in April this year um, it would, represented an opportunity to really wait, raise awareness in the public uh, and consider whether or not we uh, wish that to continue in the future and also for us, living in the mountains, you know, we live, uh, our, our place is at 1,250 meters, which is uh, in a ski station. Last year, we had two snowfalls, I think. Big one, yeah. We had one in December and uh, virtually nothing until mid-January, I think. Um, the glaciers, uh, I mean, wherever you look on the Swiss news, you'll see um, reports on the decline of the glaciers. Some of them are now we're not even considered to be glaciers anymore because they, they, the ice is gone. Um, and for, for the, the little, it's not really a town where we live, it's a cross between a town and a village, but um, for the, the tourism there, that's the lifeblood of the, of the whole place. So, you know, where they want to know, can they sustain tourism for seasons a year? Because they're not going to make the returns that they need on the winter season in the future. So we're engaging in a lot of discussions in, a, in our local uh, commune and in the, in the canton around astro-tourism, for example. Can I interrupt? Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, so what interests me is the linkage you have to these motivating factors. I mean, if I were to ask this group, can we somehow raise awareness of light pollution, as an example, in the community? I don't have an obvious answer. We mm -hmm. could go to City Hall and say, please, may we speak? That, that might be useful. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really have a mandate to go to the public schools and 
don't speak to light pollution. But again, I I haven't tried that, so I don't know. Mm. So I guess what interests me is the linkage between good ideas and effecting the ideas. And you seem to have a much better handle on that than. Uh, it's a challenge. I mean, uh, for sure. Talking, talking know, to people. It's, it's, it's reaching really out, to reaching people. out, reaching yeah. out, and, and uh, running educational sessions. Well, you mentioned the mm -hmm. uh, uh, April twenty twenty three. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, who did you speak to in order to make that? Very simple. Um, um, uh, we we had some ideas um, on roundtable discussions, and I wrote emails. Yeah. I just wrote emails to. Um, uh, of course, there were focused emails to, for example, um, in 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 our canton, we have uh, from the green parties, and I, I checked actually as well that who is who in light pollution, who is known, and um, um, uh, and and I wrote to them. And luckily enough, actually, it uh, turned out um, um, one member of the parliament in Switzerland is very much into light pollution. So we contacted her, and now we do sessions with her reading sessions. And um, uh, for the um, in, in schools, for example, we have been in contact with um, our town. Um, um, and we asked them, is yeah. there an opportunity? Yeah. Yeah. We went into the office, the tourist office, to lecture. For example, um, we are reading our book to yeah. children. Yeah. So it's really, and um, it's like always, one people knows another people who knows. Okay, and, so. um, um, and then you become as well the, the go-to person. And it's like for the, the law project, we were then by the government contacted and said, will you contribute and give us um, your feedback on our project? So we are uh, basically skillful use of communication. So yeah, yeah, building a network. Yeah, 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 building network. a network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but the key is, is talk about, sorry, the key is top down. The key is to get, the, for whatever reasons you can get, motivate, the, get, the, get the politicians the yes. to push. Yeah. Now, in your case, yeah. energy prices. Yeah, yeah, you have mm -hmm. cut off your power supply mm -hmm. from, from Russia, mm -hmm. and what are you going to do? You're going to have to reduce demand. Yeah. You know, the government says we're going to do it this way. Yeah. Um, if you can get government to act, then the people generally will start to follow. We found that in Edmonton, we had a better chance working with specific councillors and at one point the mayor to yeah. push some light pollution requirements. And if without that, we would have got nothing done. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and, and yeah. the problem is here, we, we don't have a very receptive office for government. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't have to be necessarily as well a political person. Um, it what can be as well um, um, somebody. Um, it can be a young um, sportsman or a sportswoman, which we have been in contact for the topic of the glaciers. Oh, yeah. And um, it can be as well some local person. Um, somebody is interested. You just somebody famous or somebody important. Yeah. Will be interested. Yeah, you need a sponsor. You just basically. have to find yeah. this person. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. do you make a connection to the greenhouse effect? We're yeah. actually not not making so much of a connection in terms of light pollution to the greenhouse effect. No. It's, not, it's basically energy. Well, well sure, but yeah. their energy is seventy-five percent oh, yeah. fossil fuel based. Yeah. 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 For the for the glaciers, yeah, yeah. for the glaciers, for our other book we have been um, mm. more talking yes. about this topic, yes. Yeah, yes, right. yeah. And another couple of questions. What's the majority of source for the light pollution? Like what what kinds of light fixture are you using? Are you using LEDs, are you using metal halides, are you using uh, yeah. hydrogen sodium? What, what's the primary light sources? So now um, uh, the, the trend is of course the LEDs, which is a good thing for energy, not always a good thing for the brightness, of course. But I was the other. Thing. And um, so now, um, in in different um, laws, for example, in the law project, they are really asking to focus on a on a campaign of three thousand. Yeah, and, um, uh, to, to have yes. yeah exactly the temperatures. Yeah. Um, it's it is long, um, the, the parks are renewed and we get a lot of, um, uh, we would love to do it, but we don't have the budget. 
Um, so it takes a long time for they a lot of towns have um, a plan de lumière, so uh, lightning planning a light plan. strategy, yeah. and where they say, okay, we replace um, the lights in these streets or in this area um, um, in um, 2023, and then we will. Yeah. So it's but it's it's a long process. Yeah, it's a long process, but that's certainly yeah. the most effective way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'll I see in a, in a couple of slides time, you'll see some of the approaches that we've taken okay. in terms of public meetings and, and things. Um, and, and you're right, light control is part of it in terms of where, where, the, where it goes when it comes out of the luminaire. Yeah. But also uh, moving away from the dusk to dawn photo cell yep. and, and yeah. going to time of night control, either be shutting it off or doing time of night dimming. They mean yeah, that. which you couldn't do with previous light sources. Exactly. Or using so dynamic lighting. Yeah. Or... yeah. Or the connections. A lot of towns, they had the problem that if you switch off uh, one light, you switch out everything. Right. So, um, of course, it takes a long time to um, uh, to renew all these. But yeah. now, if, if every little light has a photo cell on it, a lot of the technology with yeah. these uh, LED fixtures and have smart ballots yep. that you can program. Yeah, the technology definitely exists. You, yep. you can get those communicate one to the other so that you can piecemeal, you can att attempt yep. to reduce lighting in only certain areas at only certain times. Times, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll we'll come back to this subject of the public lighting and the and the, the you know the, the business aspects. A yeah. couple of a couple of short pieces of information on the citizen side so we are um, participating in that using the sqn yeah. meter sky quality meter which um, is canadian which is the beautiful canadian <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and uh you know you, there's a few examples there so you can see our, our observatory is around scoring around about 20 um, uh, which is Okay, and it's not bad. Um, David's house, which is his uh, colleague who is on the EGA, his is already at 20.62 because he asked the people um, in the church below to turn their lights off at night, and that they did be considerably. They were very kind, they turned the lights off, but he takes much better photographs now in the balcony. Um, and then there's a couple of other places around where, where we you know, have higher altitudes, and the uh, observatory in Saint Luc, for example, that you saw pictures of at 2200 meters is already around not far away from La Palma. In the Canaries, which of course mm -hmm. is uh, noted as a, a great site for visiting astronomy. So. Can I just interrupt, David Lee? What numbers are we seeing at the best around uh, Victoria? Uh, I would say the best is probably um, th there's a mix um, up at the observatory where we are. Um, we can reach maybe twenty or so. It's more commonly about 19. Um, our Urban Star Park, which is down in Oak Bay, is typically somewhere between 18 and 19. So they're not bad, uh, but they are still urban, you know, urban polluted environments. That, that's, that's really good for the context yeah. of what we're seeing from uh, the Bay, yeah. where average is better than the best that we can provide in mm -hmm. our yeah, viewing area. Yeah, uh, just, just just so I don't forget, uh, Michaela and Ewan, are you still here on Thursday? No, we're uh, we're leaving first thing tomorrow morning. Oh, okay. Oh, are you back? Are you back home by Thursday? Uh, we are in England on Thursday. <laughs> okay, because uh, we have a citizen science uh, sig where I could give you more details of our survey that we did recently. Okay. And I, I'd, I'd like to sort of pick your brains on what you've done as well. So maybe we can maybe we can do that maybe at a future date. Yeah. Oh, if oh, yeah. you're willing. Time difference, it might be a bit challenging. Yeah, but, 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 yeah. So we'd be we, very interested in, in, in keeping in touch and doing something oh, yeah. on a future yeah. occasion, yeah. definitely. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, so um, and this this is the slide I wanted to to show you. This is this is what uh, Michaela extracted from. Uh, one of the it's a global website, and it's I think yeah. SkyMap. SkyMap. I, I mean, at first sight, 
it looks Vancouver Island, you can see clearly, uh, and Switzerland, the uh, the band in the middle. They don't look so dissimilar, actually. Um, however, when you look at uh, the populations, and you normalize it yeah, a little bit, point of the population, um, there's still quite a bit of work to be done because uh, Vancouver Island has a much lower population density, but the same amount of light. <laughs> We're very bright here. Yeah. Oh, it, my. It seems that, I mean, uh, you know, it does seem that that is, is something that requires, I mean, it's, it's macro level data, um, but it does, it does give an indication that there's maybe still, a, particularly around the urban areas, uh, some opportunities, shall we say. Okay, can you go back to slide again? Yeah. That's crazy. That east coast is terrible. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you look at Vancouver, it's... Uh, well, in Vancouver, it's like Milano. In Milan is uh, the pink oh, world. Oh, that's, 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 that's Milan. Yeah. So Vancouver is actually probably worse than Milan, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which takes some doing, I have to say. <laughs> if you've ever been to Milan, uh, it's, it's right. a crazy place, right? Yeah. It's so, uh, yeah. So that uh, that then brings us kind of changing back, actually not changing gears, but changing back to what we were talking about before. So in terms of the the public events that we ran. Um, in the last couple of couple of years, we we started locally in in Bebe and we ran actually uh, an educational conference, um, which was supported by the uh, town of Bebe. So the, the local government uh, sort of sponsored it for us and invited us, and we had a couple of presenters, uh, two French guys. Eric Ashke is the guy who actually invented this uh, La Nuit est Belle. The uh, the night the night is beautiful in France and we introduced it into in Geneva and uh, we had a um, uh, just an educational conference in Beauvais I think which sort of set the tone and we followed that up a, a couple of months uh, later earlier this year in Lausanne uh, with a roundtable discussion and the part the, the the important thing here is to get people who have an influence around the, the table so. So the, the title of the meeting was Lausanne Ville Eclairé. And Eclairé means and both like enlightened, enlightened and enlightened, if you like. Very smart. <laughs> so it was, a, it was um, yeah, and basically we had a, a member of parliament. Uh, we had uh, David as our uh, expert. We had the CEO of um, one of the businesses. I don't know, you're probably not familiar with Nature de Covert or Pio, but it's one of the big book chains like Barnes and Noble or whatever in Switzerland, in the French speaking part of Switzerland. And we had the um, the part of the, the town of Lausanne that deals with public lighting and public services and an expert on tourism. So sustainable tourism. I didn't translate the, the French there, but um, and that was just again to enable the public to see that there are options available uh, that can be followed so this is and more recently we also did one together with Elliot um, uh, Guina on uh, in uh, Sion yeah, 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 in the yeah, Valais yeah. Uh, which was also very well attended uh, again using the same kind of theme of a round table. What, what audience did you target for the educational conference? And what audience did you actually get? We targeted the general public, oh. actually. Yeah. And uh, we got pretty much the general public. I we got say. the public, but we got as well um, a few politicians yeah. who show up. And um, then as well some um, uh, associations looking after bats or um, uh, uh, some professionals looking uh, who are engineers in enlightening um, uh, so it's a it's a mixture but uh, yeah was this mixture. national in scope or with or in no. french no these national. are local these are more it's local, local mm -hmm. region yeah this is there's the region of Vevey and the and the and the, and the, the city of Lausanne yeah. Really. yeah and the city of Sion which is yeah. uh, in, in a bit further up uh, to the east but of course you know we're a relatively 
small group of people so we have a we have fantastic limited, we limited uh, opportunities to cover all of switzerland although uh, michaela does speak german much better than me because she's german so <laughs> yeah we couldn't really do it so but we also have our own educational activities and this is one of the things that we um believe very strongly that um yeah the whole, the whole thing begins for the future with educating children. And uh, we started actually a series of, of books which all involve the same character, a little star called Alfred, who lives in Centaurus. Uh, it's a great surprise. They have a sister called Bella, uh, who uh, is kind of a twin sister. And um, we wrote a little uh, a story about... Uh, how Alfie's, Alfie's job is to survey the Earth and keep an eye uh, that everything's going on okay on the Earth, and one night he can't see it very well because there's too much light. So Excellent. he has to uh, undergo various uh, challenges to try to uh, make sure that uh, people on Earth can, can actually see the stars. And uh, the story's been passed around. I won't go into too much. Uh, more detail than that. It's actually part of a series of books that, that we've written. The, the second one, which is also published, is Alfie Saves the Alps. So that's about glacial melting. Um, and we have two other good environmental themes, which are around um, saving the sea, like not chopping plastic in the sea, um, or other things in the sea, and uh, saves the moon as well. Um, uh, but saving the moon is around, around satellite debris and uh, the fact that it seems that like there's uh, hundreds of satellites going up every uh, every other night and you see them going up you wonder what was going to happen to that eventually um, but tonight we'll talk about light pollution um, as you'll see on the on the, on the coming slide we also have a very special book which is a little bit what this is all about also for us um, but before moving on, so you can you can look us up on our website. Um, we have a whole series of, of educational materials on light pollution that we generate at the use in schools. The target target group is kind of five to eight or nine year olds. The the smaller ones love the story. They love the stories. Um, so they don't necessarily they're not able to read them, but if they're read to them. Uh, we've had some very nice uh, sessions uh, telling stories in schools, etc. Who did the artwork? Um, oh, yeah, so a young, yeah, a young lady who uh, comes from Leo, um, France, yeah. who's starting out in her career as a graphic designer. It's very good. Yeah. yeah. She's, I mean, I mean, she's professional, and for for this book, we have been very lucky as well. You asked earlier on how you do it. We have contacted uh, Professor Michel Mayor. I don't know whether you um uh, these. Well, he was a Nobel uh, laureate. Uh, Nobel laureate. 2019. 2019. And um, he goes um he's very often at the observatory observatory in Saint Luc, so he's a known well known figure there. So we just wrote to him and they said um hey could you have a look at our book, and um, let us know what you think about it and um he wrote us a very very nice uh, recommendation for 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 mm -hmm. the book yeah. So this is just gives you a little uh, summary of what the book's about. But um, just to say that for us, the, the, the we're using actually the profits from this book, uh, which are donated to a charity, which is called Twinkle. Um, and Twinkle actually is there to help finance the production and distribution of another book in our Alfie series. It's called Alfie and the Star Factory. Um, and this is a book that we've written as a support aid for children, parents, and caregivers who provide end of life care to guide the children. And uh, you can find out more about what's behind that on twinkleassociation.org. But we're all the money that we generate from, from selling these Alfie books we use to fund this because we're distributing these books world worldwide. Okay. Um, and basically, it's around. Um, it's a, a not. It's a totally agnostic, secular um, approach to what happens to my molecules after I die. 
And as we all know, our molecules don't get destroyed after we die, they go somewhere. Uh, so we wrote a little story. It's based on real conversations that we had uh, with, a, with a young man who uh, passed away a couple of years ago. So that uh, brings us to further further education and awareness uh, activities. So we've been um, quite busy over the last year or so. Um, we've been doing a lot of uh, meetings with our colleagues from Dark Sky. And we've been doing a lot of educational sessions. In fact, the young lady on my left in the top corner, that's the, that's the uh, young lady who does the illustrations uh, for the books. Uh, we've been working with uh, Dark Sky Reserves in the UK. Uh, recently, we were uh, had the pleasure to be down in Exmoor, uh, North Devon coast for the Exmoor Dark Sky Festival. Hi, uh, we've been doing, uh, yes, we been, I, I, I realise I missed some, yeah. um, but we're using actually the storytelling, we're using the, the Japanese uh, format of Kanishibai to tell the story. So we have a little audience and the, the uh, uh, Kanishibai is basically a frame and you have the images from the book, which you then pull out so it, it creates a little manual TV screen, if you like, that uh, enables us to tell the story to uh, you know, groups of, of children um, and help to educate them. The books contain, as you'll see, some of the fairly, fairly simple notions of astronomy and, uh, and things. And that brings us to the end of our journey. We hope you enjoyed your trip to Switzerland. Um, <laughs> Please do come again soon, and uh, thank you for your time. Well, we are very privileged to uh, have been able to host you. That was fascinating on so many aspects, and I'm so glad that Dorothy is going to uh, give us a question. Dorothy is uh, one of our uh, very active proponents for dark skies uh, from the biological side. All right, excellent. You're right. But you're muted. Yeah. Oh. Sometime I'll learn. <laughs> I'll remember. Yes. Oh, uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. It's been delightful. Uh, numerous ideas, but w what I'd like to point out is that night equals half, 50% of the environment, the natural environment, and it's without the darkness at night and ecosystems, individual species, ecosystems, the environment is seriously ill. Uh -huh. And many people here, certainly in my experience, and people who come up to our star parties and are Oh, because they're parties and because they like to look at the sky, but um, are more and more concerned about global warming. That's the big issue. And I wonder if you've considered, or maybe it's not as much, except I know that it is from what I've read, it, the environment is a serious uh, issue, the, the declining health of the environment all over Europe. And I'm just wondering, in terms of bringing this into at the lower levels and to to individuals here. I mean, I find that if I mention the environment or the effect of light on on that, the natural environment on animals, though people will say, "Oh yes, the turtles turn the wrong way when they hatch." I mean, these, but they haven't thought because they haven't no disrespect to them, but it hasn't been considered. So I'm, my one, uh, I guess my question is whether you've considered this and to what extent you would agree that it's for us in, in trying to elect uh, municipal politicians, many of whom are <clears throat> get their money from developers, <laughs> uh, that, that this is a, a serious issue. We have to have a public that's educated to elect yep. in yeah. the municipality I live in. We have one of all the councillors who's uh, live in Saanich. 
who has no big money support, and all the rest to varying degrees do, and are, they, they respond pleasantly to, to emails, but do nothing about it, don't change their yeah, sure. decisions. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, of course, the, the whole the whole question of global warming and uh, you know, the challenges that, that we all face, that's something which, particularly in the second book for the glacial melting, we do, a, you know, for the children, we address it directly. Um, and, you know, I invite you to, to look at the website and uh, take a look at the, at the story. Um, yeah, I've correct. looked at your website. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but I, I'm I'm wondering, and and for my colleagues, those rest of the audience, if you don't see this as being a, a route in which we can achieve, say, two things at once: uh, declining stressful input to that's contributing to global warming directly. It's the lights effect on life it's also on safety and of course worst of all but we shouldn't emphasize this to the to the non-astronomical public but for, for our hobby or profession and for kids many of who probably have, have heard at home words or on tv or wherever about the state of the environment. This is something that may, I've read in some reports, kids are even becoming, well, obviously coming very concerned about. So to get this in at, uh, as soon as possible, and the benefit is then also we can look at the sky and learn from it as we have been learning. Yeah. yeah, I mean that is was that was our uh, Doris. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, <laughs> difficult to convince um, um, adults if it's not on their agenda because they have other things to worry about. But um, these people, they do have children as well, and we have seen on our experience, thanks to our kids and uh, like uh, Celia who has made us aware of um, a lot of things, environmental topics, um, and we really um, listened to, to, to her. And that's why we wanted to really get to the, the, the children, to educate and to show them with very simple messages and fun. So we don't want to step into um, a second grade sunburn. We want children to, to learn something, to have fun, and to um, to get to simple gestures, everyday gestures. So in this book is uh, clickety click, lights out quick. So it's really and with with small things. Um, um, yes, it, we don't have a global influence, but with small things, and sometimes it's as simple as going to ask um, somebody to turn off the light, uh, a neighbor or in. Um, uh, in a, as Gavin did in his school, he had some, sometimes it's it's simple to just ask the question, and um, the risk is you get a no. But if you don't try, you won't find out. Lot, uh, lots of and I mean, no, I'm not alone. Lots of experience with with that around here. I was just thinking in terms of of the effectiveness of including. For those people, there are always going to be some many people who enjoy being shown the night sky when they have the opportunity, when they're on vacation. But for most of their lives, that's not an important point, but the health of the environment is. So to kind of try to bring to, to me, I mean, my background's in biology, but I'm I'm dedicated to both and have been for a long time and grew up in the dark. <laughs> I mean, not completely in the dark, but in, in the dark, truly dark country side, is that to get that, to balance both of these really compelling arguments for turning off the lights. And those that you need, having them, as you mentioned, the low color temperature and shielded and so on. Yeah. But it's what's effective for 
adult education as well as children. Thank you, Dorothy. Do we have yeah. other questions for uh, the Sedmans? I have a question. Hi. Your beautiful book, is it available to buy in Victoria? We have two copies. <laughs> we have two copies. <laughs> and the next lot I would maybe be coming with um, yes. our um, son-in-law in December, maybe. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, if they do come, let us know where to buy them. Well, we will be here. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Now, we're only, we're only selling them uh, uh, through through the website. We're not, we're not selling them commercially in North America at the present time, but we can always bring copies across, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, there might be uh, good interest. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. And there's also an online version that's available, right? There's an ebook e version yes. of the first of the Saves of Night that is available. Yes. Yeah, there's thank an you. E yeah. Version, but um, to be to be very honest with the um for us we like real books for children at night time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we, to the extent that for the second book we didn't make any book actually of the Alps and Saves the Alps yet. Um, because we like the paper version, yeah. Yeah. and children like books, yeah, and stories, yeah, and that's an easy way to get the message across mm -hmm. to sit with them and have some fun. And uh, yeah. yeah, we we enjoy it a lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's we, nice, have, yeah. we get a lot out of it as well, yeah, to an extent that now we are invited by one member of the parliament in Switzerland and she tells the story with us, <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, and she, yeah, yeah. 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 So, well, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for having us here. It was just wonderful. Okay. Uh, so let's do announcements now. Um, so let's David. first. Oh, oh, yeah, David has a thumbs up. <laughs> so let's first of all uh, talk calendars. And so uh, that's Joe and Laurie. Joe, are you available to talk about your calendar? You might not be. Anyway, Lori, the status is you're going to be yeah, uh, um, in orders and you'll be at the meeting next week. Uh, on, on, on this week, on Wednesday. That's right. I'll be at the at the university. I will have all the calendars with me. And anybody that would uh, that would like them, I know that some people probably won't get out to the meeting. And if you aren't, I I will have to get them to you another way. Uh, Jill has got some of the calendars, and I've kind of given her some names to try to um, to try to get them uh, to people. Uh, but I know that that's a little a little tough to make sure that we get we get in the same place at the same time. But we'll make sure absolutely that you get them. Um, I know Joe has has got the calendars like he's ordered them and um uh and he is selling them for twenty two dollars a piece so joe has compiled pictures from our club and yeah. there's an email that he just put out and uh it, it's great he, he went and mined zenfolio and uh yeah it's really good there's some drawings there's some excellent uh, astrophotography. Uh, it's a really nice portrait of what our club uh, can do. Jeff. Yeah, Lori, um, on Wednesday, I assume that you'll also want payment for the calendars. Can you tell um, me how much it'll be? Uh, it, it'll be $15. Um, dollar. We're just doing it very, very easily. Um, I mean, I think they probably cost $16 and 22 cents or something like that. But I mean, at this point, we're just we're just going to just put the fifteen dollars out and 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 do it that way. It's much easier, and we'll take cash or our checks. Um, we don't have any way to do e transfers um, uh, uh, yet. <laughs> maybe maybe someday we will, but it's going to have to be cash and checks. So fifteen dollars. Thanks. Anyway, it's a great segue to talk about the meeting on Wednesday, and Reg will talk. Hello, everyone. Um, last month at our series of 
Wednesday night talks at UVic, uh, the focus was on how to um, uh, detect planets orbiting stars. And it's astonishing uh, the achievements that uh, they have made and are on a precipice of making even better advances. This Wednesday night, uh, Dr. Brenda Matthews from NRC Hertzberg is going to be talking about millimeter wavelength and how to study uh, the behavior around uh, stars uh, and circumstellar disks uh, using the millimeter wavelength. And her career, she is a radio astronomer and uh, uh, she has had extensive experience uh, doing this and she's going to be showing results with uh, the ALMA uh, uh, Observatory and she's involved with that uh, facility as as well as the James West uh, James um, Webb uh, Space Telescope as well. So this will be kind of a leading edge insight into uh, uh, what the study of interstellar uh, our circumstellar uh, discs or uh, debris discs uh, are telling us about how the planets form. So it can be a great uh, show starting at 7.30 in room A104 of the uh, Bob Wright Center at uh, UVic. Afterwards, a lot of us will be going upstairs to uh, the uh, telescope because there might be clear skies on Wednesday night, and others will be going to the fourth floor lounge uh, at uh, the Elliott Building for uh, cookies, coffee, and conversation. And our very own Alex Smith will be opening up our very own library. So please come along and join us, and I, I hope to see you there. And if we can get 44 people to tonight's well, it was a very good presentation. But if we can get 44 people to tonight, we should be able to get 44 people to the university. Okay, so we've gone as far as Wednesday. So I think the next thing in chronological order, David, can you talk about SIGs? Yeah, I certainly can. Uh, so there's actually two SIGs uh, <laughs> this week. Uh, there's the Getting Started in Astronomy, which I, I also call the Beginner's SIG. Um, I didn't really have anything much planned, but uh, Brian just popped me a note to say that uh, from his recent trip to France, uh, he said that he's going to give a very short uh, slideshow presentation of observatories he visited in Paris and Bordeaux. So I'm, I'm actually looking forward to that. Uh, hey, also, Astro Cafe. Pardon me? I want to see that at Astro Cafe. <laughs> Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe he'll just show show us a taste, and, yeah, and there'll be a more just, detailed one at yeah, Cafe. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll do a dry run with the uh, yeah the, the the less critical crowd tomorrow. I'll I'll, I'll I'm, make I'm sure, not quite ready. I'll, not I'll, quite I'll make sure Brian doesn't give it all away. So there'll be certainly something for Cafe. Sure. Okay, and then on Thursday uh, we have our citizen science uh, uh, team. Now we haven't really done too much, but I, I would actually like to initiate something for this season. Uh, there is a globe at night um, sky brightness uh, activity that I'd like to get us all involved in. It's a very simple process, uh, not a huge time investment, but it, uh, certainly an introduction to doing kind of uh, simple, uh, simple kind of um, uh, data collection for citizen science. So those are the two things. If you don't belong to either group, just let me know. Uh, go to david at victoria.rsc.ca. Uh, let me know you're interested, and I'll send you the link. Okay. The next thing there is, next thing is the thing that's not a thing, is uh, Remembrance Day is on Saturday, and so there is a stat holiday on Monday, uh, November 13th, and so there will not be a uh, Astro Cafe next week. There is on Tuesday, November 14th, our next council meeting. And uh, so everybody on council is 
very encouraged to come so that we have our uh, quorum. And uh, but do know that the meetings are open and Ken sent around today the link. Uh, and you're welcome to see some of the uh, items in the background. And uh, among the topics, we'll be talking about uh, our AGM. And very importantly, we'll be talking about succession, who we can uh, cajole, convince, encourage to uh, be on council for the coming year because um, many hands make light work. And it's a, a, it's a very satisfying crowd to work with. And so I'm going to say out loud, often I uh, do, do consider the, uh, what, what this uh, club means to you and if uh, you would like to see it continue. Um, we, we do need some people who will take uh, some of the, the role of leadership. Uh, so that is the 14th. And so then the next item of importance, Laurie, will you talk about the following Saturday and uh, the telescope clinic? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll uh, kneel to David and David and Brock for this one as well. So the um, Friends of the DAO is having our uh, regular monthly star party. Now we've, we're have we not doing it weekly, but monthly. And um, and uh, this time it will be a, a telescope clinic. And so we're encouraging people to come up with their telescopes or things that are maybe even in a box that has never been opened or they've tried it and they couldn't put it together um, or anything at all, just anything about telescopes. So we're going to be happy to have people um, bring things up. We've got a number of people who are going to be telescope medics and uh, we'll help out. Um, we'll help out people that bring it, but we're also going to be having a small little vignettes, kind of basically on on the same thing that you did, um, Randy, is just you know small little um, bites of information about telescopes that people will be able to to move into and go and and hear a little bit about something and then and then be able to um, have somebody help them with the telescope and then maybe go back in to get you know some more information about things and then we'll all also have all the other things happening so that there will be. Um, the planetarium tour, there will be the, the dome tours, um, there will be uh, children's activities, all of that will still continue to go on. And we hope that we have a good night um, on the on the Saturday night. And I am so sorry to our visitors that we did not get you up to the observatory. I'm so hey. sad you're leaving tomorrow <laughs> because I was just going to say, oh my goodness, we need to get you up and and doing this. But um, I'm you know, I was away for a while there, so didn't get it. Next time. Oh, oh yeah, uh, we say we are being yeah. here now. Um, <laughs> since our daughter just moved here, we will be back. Oh. In the yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. well, you'll have to. You'll have to do. I. I would think the next time you come, we're going to have to have one of your stellar presentations to the public at one of our star parties so that mm -hmm. we that that kind of thing can mm -hmm. be brought because that's not just a Switzerland thing. That is a global thing mm -hmm. that we need to talk about. So, so, so Lori, Lori, Lori could. Some of their children's books find a home at the center. As oh, well. the children! <laughs> I'm just, I am just, I'm just, I'm just drooling here. I would absolutely love to have them. That, and as soon as I can get my hands on them, they'll be up at the center. Yeah, thank we'll you. Them and and trust someone to bring some across for you. Yes, right? please do. <laughs> we'll make sure that we we uh, we definitely get them. Um, and David, is there anything else that you'd like to say about? Yeah, the, about I, I I want to I want to say that. Uh, the night won't be just uh, for people that have problems. I, I oh, think yeah. it's an I think it's an excellent introduction for somebody who doesn't really know too much about telescopes and they want to learn about telescopes. It's a perfect night for that as well because we're going to go over the different types of telescopes. Uh, we're going to go over general things to look at. So say say you're shopping for Christmas or you're shopping for yourself because you just started. It's a perfect night for you too. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, I think that's a very good segue to, um, I think it was Reg who brought it up to me, that uh, in the before days, 
uh, there would always be, I guess, something like late November, early December, uh, an equipment swap. And it would be really good if we could get more of the crowd here in this room on a Monday night with the uh, with the pieces of gear that you know somebody else will love more than what you that than, than you have in your uh, collection. And uh, you know, we just have to set a date. Um, so I am going to very arbitrarily um, say that we probably should aim at the uh, last Monday in November. That gives people about three weeks to uh, consider. And uh, I guess I'm going to even make an offer that if you can get the stuff to me, I can then bring the things in on that Monday night uh, if you can't actually show up on a Monday night. So I guess that's more for the people who are listening to me on the uh, YouTube, uh, you know, the follow-up if you're not here live today. But uh, let's, um, let's have another equipment swap. It's really, really good. Everybody has their uh, eyepieces that they, you know, their second one that they don't want anymore. But that's going to be a really good first one for somebody. Um, telescopes, other equipment. Uh, so we'll um, we'll advertise this uh, more, but um, let's ha let's have a good equipment swap, like we haven't had since probably twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen, yeah, probably. Okay. Um, oh, and the other thing is, if you do have more major items. That you want to part with, um, please let us know ahead of time so that we can advertise their availability. Um, because if people want them, then they need to um, bring some money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, can somebody actually give us the date of that? Uh, the 27th, it's three weeks tonight. November 27. Cool. And Randy, congratulations on saying in the most circuitous way possible, bring junk you want to get rid of. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I have prepared something, as is my want. But uh, does anybody else have any pictures or things they want to show off? <laughs> I have an event hey, Chris, coming Chris. up. Go for it. Okay. And this is the event. Just a second here. So for all you uh, JWST lovers, this show, which will be using JWST images, is going to be... Uh, on at the uh, uh, IMAX Theater um, at the Royal BC Museum. I believe it starts November 17th and is around for a couple of weeks after that. So uh, look it up on the uh, website there. And, uh, you know, if you want to see uh, uh, th these images and, you know, five stories high, this <laughs> is your chance. And I think there's be footage of, you know, when they're launching and building JWST, things like that. It might be fun for us to choose one of the uh, presentations and just say, everybody who can come at that time, it might be nice to, to go there as a uh, Victoria Center crowd. Yeah. Anyway, we'll bring that up and, and try to choose a, a time once we see the schedule. But that's great, Chris. Yeah, the, the schedule is is up. So uh, so uh, that, that's something else for council to discuss. <laughs> and Lori? Yes, I was just going to say, I actually just saw it in Seattle 
um, on Saturday. Uh, it was on at the IMAX in Seattle, and uh, it's it's wonderful, and it is five stories tall, and it is <laughs> it's terrific. Um, uh, really, really a good uh, balanced. Uh, way of how of how it was launched and all some of the problems that occurred and and uh, the mix of um, of for me of women that were talking the women that were all involved in this is absolutely as prominent if if not more so than some of the men that were talking which we know okay. you know is is kind of part of it as well um, uh, a little bit too much of you know very very um tumultuous music at the end about how you know are we going to be the only ones in the universe and that the jwsc will be looking for this i mean just like slightly over the top right at the end but 98 percent of it is really good <laughs> so <laughs> and um what we're trying to uh the um ben dorman from the fdao is is contacting the people at imax to see whether or not we can get something like one of the people that are at NRC that are actually working on JWST, if they can come and give a bit of a presentation for one of the, you know, for one of the the talks or one of the the sessions, they can come and give a talk. Maybe we can put some telescopes out on the deck, like at the, you know, like on a like at the at the evening. Uh, we can make this a we can make this a thing, you know, it would be great. So um, we can, we're, we'll kind of look, we'll tell you about it. I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure that the IMAX would give us some sort of uh, deal on some tickets for the RESC. Because they've done it in the past. Just looking at the schedule and it looks like we've got the window between the 17th and 26th of November. So we need to move. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. By the way, as, as speaking of women in astronomy, uh, I got a press release uh, a few days ago announcing that for the first time, the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute is going to be a woman, and her name is uh, Dr. Jennifer Lotz. And uh, so they've had acting women, uh, directors who've been women, but this is the, the first full-dress uh, director in the history of the Space Telescope Institute. So uh, if I still haven't finished my book yet, I put her picture in it, but I can't now. <laughs> Great. Rock. Randy, I could show some images. I put a few together while we were chatting. Yay. Over the past month and a bit, I haven't actually shown it the last few SIGs, so I've got a few piled up here. So this, if you can see it, is um, part of the Andromeda galaxy. Oh, wait a second. Uh, it stopped uh, again, I think, Reduta. Oh, no. No, no, I think no. Need, OK, we you need to, uh, maybe I have to share my screen. Gonna... I think that is on top of it, Alex, if you can move it to the. OK, OK, we're, we're yeah, 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 we got it, we got it. Is working? Yeah. yeah. OK. So this is the NGC 206, I think, which is a region of the Andromeda galaxy, which has some really ultra huge blue uh, stars in it. And um, you can actually zoom in and see individual stars within another galaxy, which is pretty cool. Are these dark? Um shadows actually related to the star creation? Are there, so it, is the dark actually related to the light parts? Well, the dark nebula is a bunch of gas and, and, and dust, which is condensing and is generally cooler. And it does sometimes lead to star formation, to my knowledge. And you can see actually some young star forming regions here, which are, you know, lots of red glowing hydrogen around young stars, which is also seems to be associated with the, the dark dust regions. But I'm not a galactic physicist or anything, so there may be someone that can speak more to that. But along those lines, I also have another very similar distance galaxy, uh, M33, or the Triangulum. 
And uh, this one I also did at about the same time, looking again to try to resolve stars within it. And clearly, there's almost seems to be even more resolvable stars here. But even more interesting than Andromeda, the number of nebulae, like the various, you know, things that are star clusters with clouds of glowing gas around them and what have you. It's pretty, it's a pretty spectacular uh, galaxy, really. In, in, in a lot of ways, it's more interesting than Andromeda because of the just the sheer number of, of hydrogen regions in it that are forming stars and what have you, so. How many nights uh, data is that? Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember. It's probably three or four nights, just guessing. Brock, what is the, um, what's the nebula type object at around seven o'clock? Um, yeah, this one guy. down here? Yeah. I would imagine it's some sort of star forming region, a hydrogen dense area with lots of oh. young stars that are creating a it's lot of NGC 604. 604, oh, thank there you. it is. Bill knows. What is it, Bill? Is there any background you know? It's an H2 region. In the, that's M33, right? Yeah, it is. Oh. Yeah. It's, it must be, I'm sure if you live in this arm of the uh, galaxy, that's probably one of your favorite night sky objects. It's it's like the Orion Nebula. Yeah, right. exactly. If there's if you lived few, in N33. Yeah. There's another one up here, which there's a couple of them up here, which are just gorgeous. Amazing. Like this even has a similar look to the Orion Nebula, except it's not as much hydrogen. Mm. But um, but yeah, it's it's you just you can look at it for quite a while. I won't go on too long. Um, I also managed to get another shot of Jupiter which was a, quite a nice night and got some really nice detail. Opposition, I think just last week or a couple of weeks ago. The last week, I think. And then I also got some time with the Elephant Nebula. This was an attempt I did at the Hubble palette. And then the same data just turned into more true representation of the colors that are out there. Oh, can you flash between the two? Sure. That's wonderful. Might trigger an epileptic fit. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> and then another galaxy shot. This one is the fireworks, which is also a very, very hydrogen rich, um, lots of star forming regions in there. It's a little bit further away, so we don't have anywhere near the resolution that we do on Triangulum and, and, uh, and Andromeda, but it is, far enough out that you can get a more open, you know, wide field view of some of the the thinner sort of bands that extend beyond the main core of the galaxy. So, and then this one is um, a couple, there's an open cluster, uh, NGC 7142 and NGC 7129. I can't remember which is which, um, but there's a reflection nebula, which is quite nice with some stars that are making it glow nicely. There's a bit of dark nebulosity and then there's a nice open cluster here. And then there's a couple of galaxies visible in the, in the distant background. Which I thought was a nice, kind of nice area. Sorry? Where is that in the sky? Oh, I have the notes uh, probably in Zenfolio. I could look quickly. Do I have that? I don't know where they are. He just takes the pictures. <laughs> I don't remember it all. But uh, great picture. That? I will find out. Yeah. I think Very I have nice, it noted here. It's in Cepheus or Cepheus, if, depending mm -hmm. on how you want to pronounce it. And then the last one is, I think, a shot of the Horsehead Nebula. I might have one more here. but uh, And of course, that's in Orion which is, of course, rising earlier and earlier every night. So, And one more shot. I was actually, uh, I got another wide field view of, of M31 Andromeda. This one, actually, I was using a monochrome camera doing 
um, LRGB. So hadn't done much of that myself. So thought I'd give that a try, see how that worked out. So yep, very nice. And that's all I have. Well, the, the interesting one, Brock, was uh, when you showed the horse head nebula and the yep. set. You mentioned it. You tried to compare it to the our solar system. Oh yeah, yeah. I mentioned that at our other meeting. I was trying to get a sense of scale to somebody who was asking how large it was, and and I was. I did a bit of reading up on on the scale of it and tried to I was thinking I would put a picture of our solar system in it and then I realized that our solar system even out to the Oort cloud beyond would not even fill a pixel in this image like it's oh, yeah. this, <laughs> it's just such these things are just such massive regions of space it really is mind-boggling how big they are <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you. That was spectacular. Time well spent, Brock. I've got a couple of pictures if oh, you like. Okay, Sam. go for it, Ken. Yeah, Ken's got some great ones. Uh... <laughs> Oh, whoops. Old worst enemy there. Very powerful. One click and Andromeda is gone. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, uh, Sharon's Queen has stopped. Oh, we can see it. Yeah. Oh, okay. What is that? This is um, a hydrogen region in NGC 782. It's uh, a region in the constellation of Cepheus. And uh, actually, Reg looked into these uh, pillars here. Uh, they're called elephant trunks, apparently. And he said they're... Uh, they're acting like a, uh, uh, they're, they're turning, acting sort of like a drill bit. He said there's a lot of uh, uh, magnetic uh, forces involved around those. Uh, map, the, map the hydrogen to yellow? Uh, yeah, and it, it, actually that was just straight hydrogen. Uh, that was uh, just a red filter on that one. Then, uh, <laughs> then Dave mentioned I should try a couple of other channels. So I put uh, RGB into this one, which is the uh, bubble nebula over here and the lobster claw nebula. And this is an RGB of it. And then I thought I'd try a Hubble palette of the same thing, and that's what I got out of that. And again, can you flash back and forth between the two? So your feature, uh, Ken, is the bubble on the left-hand side, right? Uh, if you zoom in on the left hand side, you'll see the bubble. Yeah, the bubble's right in here. Yeah. Uh, I may have shown this before, I'm not sure, but this is the, the heart nebula and the fish head nebula. I'll, uh, I'll show you the Andromeda one, too. This is a three-pane mosaic of uh, the Andromeda galaxy. One pane would be up to here. And the center pane would go up to about here. But uh, once again, it just uh, blows me away how you can uh, get such resolution on these uh, uh, hot stars in here. And this is with just over a four inch 
diameter skull, 107 millimeters. Uh, I couldn't pull out the hydrogen uh, on this area very well. So I'm going to get a hydrogen filter. This is another one that I did. This was up at the star party. And there's about five days in here, but I, I couldn't pull the rest of the uh, information out of it. But I know a bit more now, so I'll go back and give this some work. But there's still a lot of nice, nice detail there. Ben, what is this one? That's the Andromeda Galaxy. Oh. It's just, you know, you can get the size of the hydrogen regions going around here. But for some reason, I just couldn't get the data out of here. But I think I can do a better job of that now. So there's the Heart Nebula, and I did the Soul Nebula, too. And this is my last one. Yeah, this is the one, Ken, that I thought was uh, so interesting for me anyways. The the blue, for some reason, I, I think it must have something to do with color, mm -hmm. um, seems to recede. And the, all your other stuff is so much in relief. It basically sits apart from it quite a bit, actually, to me anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's kind of in circle, too, I think. Yeah. You know? And it's like it's like looking into a skull or something like that or exactly. or into a crystal or something like that. Yeah, one of those hollowed out rocks. <laughs> like a geode, yeah. Yeah. What camera are you using, Ken? I've got an ASI uh 2600. Uh this is an MM, a mono. I've I've had problems with the stars, so I haven't been getting the color out of the stars. But I think I've uh, tracked down the problem probably to my uh, dark and bias files. So hopefully, I'll have them better in the future. That's, That's all fantastic, I have. Fantastic, Ken. Just beautiful. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. So, Randy, I have something from the VCO. I, I, I hope, um, I hope Reg can do a lead into this before I show the image, because it, it's got a bit of a story here. Uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Is this some sort of scandal, David? We, we <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, maybe, maybe I can tell the story, and the uh, Reg can sort of fill in the gaps. So um, I think this was back uh, just before Halloween. I think it was on the 28th of October. So we we had a, a fairly good night. And Reg and I have been sort of working on getting the uh, VCO ready with all the new components that we have. And one of the new things that we purchased recently was a set of narrowband filters. And uh, what I'm about to show you is an image that we took so this is almost like first light with uh, this set of filters. Now I didn't use all the filters, but I used two of them. So I'll, I'll show you what that is right now. Did you want to add anything more to that, uh, Reg? Well, it was a full moon. Oh yeah, yeah. The moon, this object was 90 degrees away from the full moon, but it shows that uh, uh, the VCO is not out of commission on a full moon night. So. No. So this is uh this is M27. Yeah. Yeah. This is the dumbbell. Yeah. I was pretty floored by the data. It's um I think it's only 10, it's 10 minutes in no, it's 20 minutes in each channel uh of hydrogen and oxygen. I didn't use the S2 channel at all, actually. Um this one is the HOO palette. So what you do in the red, green, and blue channels. You put the hydrogen alpha in red, and then you use O3 for both green and blue. And that's how you get that. But uh, we still don't have a, I mean, I I think Brock still has the 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 the, the pivotal image of uh, of this uh, object. Um, you can sort of make out the outer shell, but we just don't have enough exposure to get get the whole thing. And I understand that 
on a moonless night, it would even be better. But it goes to show you that you're not totally stymied on a on a moonlit night. So I I really kind of like this uh, structure in the inside here, and uh, in this outer outer shell as well. Remarkable. Well done. Yeah, the other the other thing I noticed about narrowband also was that you certainly don't have as many stars. It it certainly uh, kind of dims down most of the stars, so you don't get as many stars. Um, that can be a good thing. Like if you're in a kind of a star rich area and you want to feature the object, um, narrowband works really really well. So there you go. Okay, well, you'll not be surprised that um, the the light pollution of the moon to some people is actually a feature for some others. And uh, so I'm going to talk about what I did yesterday morning. So let's share. And F5. Hello, can you do it? Yes, yeah, I mean, it's just we're having trouble. People keep moving over and blocking our view. <laughs> Maybe you could run his presentation. There we go. Um, yeah, so so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about my process yesterday, because uh, I don't do that very often. And I was really pleased with uh, my, my little time with, with the moon yesterday morning. Um, so first thing I do, especially if it's going to be um, a middle of the night uh, viewing of the moon, the night before, I'll uh, go to the dial -a moon website. Uh, and so it was a lovely last quarter moon. And then um, when you click on the image, then you get this very large TIFF file. Um, so Alan, can you get rid of the band at the bottom? I forget what the trick is to do that. It's that um, there's a highlight on more. You've got to get rid of that, whatever that thing is there. Look at the chat and then close it. There. It's the top one, that one, and then close it, just X it out. Yeah, okay, thank you. There. Anyway, and so- it will go away if you don't keep the mouse at the bottom. There. So I, this is something they, that every December, NASA comes out with an image for every hour of the coming year. And with dial -a moon you can pick up the, these, these images and the, the top left shows where the moon is around the Earth, and you can see that we're getting close to apogee, it's getting to be smaller. Um, the bottom left shows you uh, the uh, libration, how, how the moon has wobbled. There's some data over on the right, but what is really wonderful is you can zoom in on the image. And so, you know, I looked through and I was wondering, do I want to do another uh, sketch of my favorite uh, crater, uh, Clavius? But I just did that the last time I had my telescope out. So uh, then I was thinking maybe I should go up to Archimedes. It has that beautiful like mountain shadow on it uh, that yesterday morning. Uh, the thing that I still have not seen in Plato are the little craterlets, those little white dots. Let's see if I can get the mouse there, these guys. Bill says I should be able to see them with my six inch, but um, someday I will see the craterlets of Plato. But what, what caught my interest, something I've never seen, there's this great triplet, Ptolemaeus, Alphonsus, and Arzakel, uh, really right in the middle of the moon. But um, it was the contrast of these two, these two craters that really caught me. 
And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could see that with my six inch? So I set up in the morning. This was actually not uh, yesterday. This was from September, but you get to see my gear. I have this Franken telescope. It's a Canadian built Omcom six inch Newtonian, uh, a Celestron eyepiece that I bought from uh, Bruce. I have to say, I have my $150 rule. I'll never spend more than $150 on anything, but I did on the eyepieces. Oh, and uh, and you know what? <laughs> a nice eyepiece is really worth it. Um, the, the mount here is actually a club mount that I have adapted. Uh, it's on a different tripod, which you can see some wood that I used to put it together. And there is a motor, but no controller on this. So here, um, I built my own little controller nudger for, for the telescope. Um, and then I have my book and I use a red light and you'll, you'll see this. So uh, first thing I do with a uh, 2H sharp pencil is I'll do the um, kind of the outlines of where the craters are. And then um, I do this on gray paper and I, I have a white mechanical pencil. Very hard to find that. I found that at Lee Valley, um, but, but I would go at the white before I start shading in with the black because it's very hard with white to get different shades of white. But um, you can go over the white with some with a, with a black pencil. And I find that that works pretty well. And th there are things that, you know, when you just look at it quickly, you don't notice them, but there are these like amazing stripes here. And those, um, it turns out, are uh, ejecta from the Imbrium Sea, when the Imbrium Sea, which is to the uh, northwest, so down and to the left, um, when, when it was formed, you see this all over, right, right around on, on the moon. But there's these, this kind of spoke on Alphonsus, and uh, and I, I was quite, they, 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 these two craters were very, very clear. Anyway, then I'll go at it with a very dull 2B pencil and uh, shade in. I'll, I'll, I'll use the sharp pencil for where it's appropriate, but it's mostly done with the 2B. Oh, I want to show that we also had the uh, rupus recta, the straight wall was in the, the scene. Anyway, this, this was then afterwards, then I go in again with the sharp pencil, I'll take out my atlas uh, and um, start labeling the, the uh, diagram. So this is, this is my finished diagram. Oh, and I brought it for the people here show and tell around here. Yeah. Randy, could you zoom in on the image so I can see some of the detail? Uh, yes, yes, let's do that. We can do that with... Oh yeah, thank you. Anyway, um, let's, let's continue. I've got a few more slides that I wanna, you know, that, that's the, the product, but oh, there I go, to zoom it in for you. So this was comparing it to the uh, dial -a moon the, the, the NASA thing. And again, it's this, it's actually um, a ghost uh, crater in that, first of all, Ptolemaeus was made by an impact. It's about 150 kilometers across. And then, there are actually several of these um, craters that predated being filled in by the basalt. And I have to find out more about this. This, this, this actually blows me away that um, it's not just the mare, it's also the craters um, get filled in later on by this volcanic rock. I, and I have to find out more. And then after that, then, what is sometimes called Ptolemaeus A, but it's also called uh, Ammonius, uh, then, then came after the basalt. So, so we have the crater was made, 
Then it got impacted several times. You can see several of these. I only drew this one on my diagram. And then it got filled with basalt, but it left these, these ghost um, craters. And then later on came this very late one and it's still very sharp. So if we compare this, uh, Mike Nash, who lives in the Western communities, um, is he takes fantastic pictures. Um, he doesn't join our Astro Cafe very often, but um, he's a very active uh, lunar photographer. So this picture was taken on uh, Saturday, so a day before, and uh, you can see the ghost crater. That, that's actually called Ptolemaeus B. You can see that it's there, but it's very, very faint. And then if you go back to a full moon, this was in, you know, in uh, end of September. Oh, the same day that you guys probably were up on the uh, observatory looking at the dumbbell. Um, Mike took this picture. And what's kind of cool, it's, it's, it's harder to find the Ptolemaeus, but look at Ammonius, it is super bright. It's a young crater. It hasn't dulled down by being hit by micro craters for 3 billion years. There's a little suspicion of the ghost crater here, but you really don't see it. Quite something. So uh, it's moral of the story that I hope everybody knows now, the more you look, the more you see, and it's worth being out there with your uh, eyeball on an eyepiece. So Randy, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Uh, this, this trio of craters, uh, I've observed them before, but I don't recall how rapidly the shadow moves. Like if you focused on the this trio over half an hour, would you noticeably see the shadows move across? Um, I did. I did see quite a change in uh, Arzakel over the hour or so that I was at this. Um, yeah, the, the, the contour here, definitely um, this was getting to be longer. The, the, this, this mountain here, it's called Gamma. I think it's called Gamma, but Ptolemaeus Gamma. You use Greek letters for the mountains and use uh, Latin letters for the craters. Um, and it's about three kilometers high. So 3,000 meters, who knows their uh, Rockies? What, what's what's <laughs> kilometer, 3,000 meters? Is that a, uh, does anybody know what to compare that to here? Yeah, what, what's our mountain with that compared to? Oh, I don't know. What's rock rocks and places? Rocks and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, rocks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so it's like a good, it's a good rocky. It's, it's a decent size. It's a good <laughs> it's a nice mountain. Anyway, so so um, but if that's 150 kilometers across, then we're talking. It's got a 30 kilometer, a 10 to one, uh, sort of shadow. That's it's a pretty low uh, sun there. So yeah, it's going to change quickly. Mount Baker's mm -hmm. 30 to 88. Ah, yeah. OK, so think of Mount Baker there. Wow. And so uh, right at, this is going to be sunrise. Don't forget, we're upside down here. South is in the, the top of this picture. So um, we're, we're, we're right at, at um, oh, no, no, the sun's in the west. That's right, and this is sunset. There you go. I'm gonna to have to think about that. Hmm. I'm always intrigued by the craters that cast a sawtooth shaped shadow because you can really see the rough edge of the crater, the crater wall. Mm -hmm. It's very satisfying. Margie raised her hand. But you're still muted. There you go. Well, I don't know whether you can see this. Oh, Alex, can you embiggen her? 
Yes. Oh, there we are. Nice. <laughs> Good for you. Mm. That was Ptolemaeus on April the 27th at 2115. And lit from the other side. You, you saw it in the <laughs> evening, and mine was uh, the waning moon. You were the waxing moon, and I was seeing the waning moon. Cool. Nice. How many hours of work? That was about an hour. Okay, well, um, that might be it for tonight. Oh, it is it's it's nine o'clock. Yeah, that is it. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody. We'll not see you next week, and we will see you on the 20th. And I don't know what's programmed for then, but I'm sure yeah. it will be wonderful. See you then. We'll, we'll see people up at UVic, though, right? For people that are going up. And people will be up at UVic on this Wednesday. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.